Thanks for tuning in to No Wine in No Time. I'm your host Dave and today we're going to explore a black skin red wine grape by the name of Saparavi. Now Saparavi may be the oldest grape ever used to cultivate wine. Where is it native to? Well, it's native to the Caucasus area and that is what is today modern day Georgia and also part of Russia and that's where it really reaches its best expression. When we look at the word Saparavi and we translate it from the native dialect, it actually means dye or paint, so D-Y-E, like something that gives color. And it's because this grape is in a category of wine grapes that we call Tonturier. So Tonturier means that the grape itself, the skins, have anthocyanins, but the pulp also has anthocyanins. So think about the last time you went to the store and you bought a black skin or a red skin grape. You bit it in half, the pulp inside is clear. And for 99% of wine grapes, that is the way that grape would present itself. But Tonturier grapes like Saparavi, the anthocyanins are abundant both in the skins but also in the pulp itself. So this produces a red wine that's very, very rich in color. So if we look at Saparavi grapes, let's talk about how they cultivate and what challenges they present. So this grape has medium to large berries. The skins themselves are a little bit thinner and they also grow in loose clusters, which is very important because as the grapes themselves grow in the vineyards and mature, loose clusters make sure that air can get in between the berries and put mold and mildew at bay. They also are very hardy and they can handle extremely cold weather and they grow at higher altitudes. Now when we look at wine production in Georgia, as I mentioned before, this is the birthplace of wine and we actually have a No Wine and No Time video specifically on the country of Georgia. You should check that out. It talks about how 8,000 years ago these guys were the first ones to either discover or produce wine. So let's think about Saparavi winemaking today in Georgia and how that's done. Well, there's really two schools of thought as wine production has become more modernized and more technologically savvy. You have modern winemakers who do the crush, the pump over, the fermentation and the barrel aging. And then you have the traditionalists that actually make a wild wine in an ancient clay pot called a kevri. So this is a situation where they take Saparavi grapes, they crush them, they put them into that kevri, they seal it with beeswax, and the fermentation is done naturally with the yeast that's on the grapes themselves. When it's opened up, there's wine, but there's also all that must in there, which provides a significant tannic body. So when you go out and look for a Saparavi in your local wine store, you probably should read the back side of the label to find out if it's done through the modern winemaking process, which will seem a little bit more traditional to most consumers, or if it's done in the ancient way with the Kevri. Also on Saparavi, there's three different paths they use when they produce the wine, and it pertains to sweetness. Saparavi can be used to make a sweet wine, a semi-sweet wine, or a dry wine like the one that I chose for you today. So when we think about Saparavi and all that it brings to the table, let's talk about what it might pair very well with. So I like it with things like a deep dish pizza, something that's rich, um, has a lot of tomato sauce, meat in the deep dish pizza. That'll be perfect. Also, it likes smoky meat. So let's think barbecued pork chops on the grill and also any type of pasta like manicotti that's stuffed with cheeses. This is a perfect accompaniment to that. So let's dive in and take a look at a traditional dry Saparavi and see how it might present itself. Well, the one I picked for you today is from Chateau, Chateau Mukrani, and these guys are in the Kakedi area of Georgia, probably the place where Saparavi is grown at its highest expression. So if we take a look at the wine, the first thing that we'll notice is that we can't see through it at all. This wine is completely opaque and just because I'm getting some light through it I see a little bit of purple hints around the edges. When we swirl to liberate the aromas 
what jumps out of the glass is somewhere between, uh, let's say, a dark chocolate or mocha, a little bit of coffee, and beautiful fruit, almost like a plum paste. Really quite intriguing. Let's go ahead and take a sip. When the Chateau Mukrani rolls across the palate, the first thing that we notice is that beautiful dark fruit. So think things like blackberries, think cassis or black currant, think plums, very dark in its presentation. Mid palate, I feel some beautiful spiciness that's coming out in form of espresso bean, a little bit of um, high cacao dark chocolate, and just a little bit of almost creamy creaminess bordering on some tobacco influences. On the back side of the palate, we certainly feel the influence of this wine being aged in oak barrels. We have kind of a caramely vanilla type of flavor, which really rounds it out. Beautifully complex. I can tell you, if you're a consumer that loves Cabernet Sauvignon in the modern style, seek out one of these more modern Georgia Saparavis. Chateau Mukrani is a great choice. So I'm going to get back and enjoy a little bit more of this wine, and I ask that you tune in next time, because soon you'll know wine in no time. Mm -hmm.